Hi, my name is Arjun Raj, and this slidecast is to introduce our work linking variability in gene expression to the phenomenon of incomplete penetrance in the nematode Cineroviditis elegans. Very broadly, we are interested in understanding why individuals are different from each other. One source of population heterogeneity is genetic variation, whereby genetic differences manifest themselves as differences in skin color, height, and so forth. Environmental differences provide another source of variability between individuals, where even genetically similar organisms, plants in this case, can display marked phenotypic variation depending on, say, the amount of light in which the plants were grown. But what if we could control for genetic and environmental differences? If we had a set of genetically identical organisms grown in, hom in a homogeneous environment, would we still see differences between individuals? In other words, what about random variation? As it turns out, researchers have recently shown that the intrinsically random nature of the biochemistry involved in transcription and translation can lead to dramatic cell-to-cell -cell variability in gene expression even in genetically identical populations of bacteria, yeast, and mammalian cells. If you are interested in learning more about this, I recommend reading our review in Cell called Nature, Nurture, or Chance, Stochastic Gene Expression and Its Consequences. Many of these initial studies utilize fluorescent protein expression reporters to measure gene expression in single cells. My work over the last several years has focused on developing methods for counting individual mRNA molecules in single cells, thus yielding a very quantitative and sensitive means for measuring cell-to-cell -cell variability in gene expression. If you are interested in learning more about these methods, please see our Nature Methods paper and our website singlemoleculefish.com. Our method is partially based upon one developed by Rob Singer at Albert Einstein. See Femino et al. Science 1998 for details. In the past, we used this method to show that variability in gene expression leads to random cell fate selection in the bacterium B. subtilis. Generally, variability is thought to be useful for bacteria in that it allows genetically identical populations to commit subpopulations to different cell fates, thereby hedging their bets against future environmental changes. This reasoning, however, is less applicable to multicellular organisms where cell fates must be tightly coordinated throughout the developmental process. Surprisingly, though, we have found that gene expression in higher eukaryotic cells is highly variable from cell to cell, far more variable, in fact, than in bacteria. This is thought to result from the involvement of chromatin remodeling in gene expression, leading to transcriptional bursts. So, given that gene expression is so variable in multicellular organisms, one might expect that even genetically identical multicellular organisms would exhibit large phenotypic variability. The reality, however, is that genetically identical multicellular organisms exhibit remarkably few phenotypic differences. Our interests lie in understanding how multicellular organisms are able to produce such reliable results despite working with such imprecise components. The nematode C. elegans is in many ways the ideal system in which to study developmental robustness because the fate of each cell upon cell division is almost completely specified for the lifetime of the organism. In our work, we study the cell fate determination of the two cells circled here, which, in wild-type worms, always develop into the worm intestine. In certain mutant worms, however, this invariant cell fate specification is disrupted, with even genetically identical mutant worms showing marked differences in cell fate within a population. This particular mutant results in an incompletely penetrant lack of gut cells in the developing embryo. Our question, then, was whether variability in gene expression underlies the incomplete penetrance of this phenotype. First, a quick introduction to C. elegans intestinal development. The 20 cells that comprise the C. elegans intestine are all descended from the E cell. The E cells are instructed to become intestinal cells through the activity of a genetic network consisting of the transcription factors SKIN1, MED1 and 2, N3, END1, ending with the expression of the gene ELT2. ELT2 is a master regulator that activates hundreds of genes that differentiate the cell into a gut cell and is activated in an or like fashion by N3 and END1. This network was elucidated by some really great genetic work done by Morris Maduro and other members of the lab of Joel Rothman at UCSB and also Jim McGee at University of Calgary. Here we have studied the incomplete penetrance of mutations to the SKIN1 gene, originally characterized by Bruce Bowerman at University of Oregon. In order to measure gene expression variability between embryos, we utilized our single molecule mRNA detection method to count transcripts of genes in the gut specification network. 
Here, for instance, we labeled L2 mRNAs in red and stained nuclei in blue, finding that all sufficiently late-staged wild-type embryos had abundant L2 expression. In contrast, we found that mutations to skin 1 resulted in an on-off pattern of L2 expression within otherwise identical mutant embryos, reflecting the incomplete penetrance of the lack of gut phenotype. We then sought to determine the source of L2 expression variability by using multicolor fish to measure expression of all the components of the gut specification pathway simultaneously. Here we show some wild-type embryos in which we measure the expression of N3, ND1, MED1 and 2, and L2, all on an embryo-by-embryo -embryo basis. The number of nuclei serves as an indicator of the developmental stage of the organism. By imaging large numbers of differently staged embryos, we were able to reconstruct developmental gene expression time courses. In the wild type, we found that the expression of MED1 and 2, N3, and N1 proceeded in coordinated waves, with L2 being robustly activated after the 50 cell stage. In contrast, gene expression in the skin 1 mutants is highly variable. Let's go through the differences. First, the mutations we are interested in are premature stop codons in the gene skin 1. The next thing to notice is that the expression of L2 is bimodal. This is the incomplete penetrance of the mutant phenotype. We also found that MED1 and 2 and N3 were dramatically downregulated in the mutants. This effectively eliminates many of the network interactions in the wild-type gut differentiation network, leaving end one as the sole remaining activator of L2. The most interesting observation about the expression of end one in the mutant was that it was far more variable than in the wild-type, with some embryos expressing almost no end one at all, and others expressing almost wild-type levels of end one. Given that end one is the only activator of L2, we hypothesize that end one expression must pass a threshold in order to turn on L2. In the wild type, expression is always above the threshold, but in the mutant, end one is sometimes above the threshold and sometimes below, resulting in the on-off pattern of L2 expression. In order to test this, we utilize the fact that we measured both end one and L2 expression in each embryo, thus allowing us to look for correlations between end one and L2 expression in the mutant strain. Indeed, we saw such a correlation in all the skin one mutant strains we examined finding that high levels of end one expression were required for expression of L2. Interestingly, we found that the different penetrances of the various skin one mutant alleles arose from different thresholds for L2 activation. We do not yet know what factors lead to these differences in threshold. We also examined how other genes in the network affected the variability in end one and L2 expression. We found that elimination of end one left the expression of the remaining genes essentially unchanged confirming the OR logic of L2 activation. The removal of N3, however, did have important consequences. First, while N1 expression was mostly intact, occasional embryos displayed low levels of N1 expression reminiscent of those in the skin 1 mutants. Moreover, the activation of L2 became far less robust, and while the majority of embryos ended up expressing L2 eventually, the expression level is highly variable. Indeed, 5% of these embryos fail to make gut altogether. We also examined the mechanism of end one expression and variability. As mentioned earlier, transcription in higher eukaryotes occurs in bursts, and these bursts are thought to be the result of transitions of the gene itself between an active euchromatic state and an inactive heterochromatic state. You can check out our paper in PLOS Biology for more details. To see the effects of chromatin remodeling upon variability in end one expression, we knocked down the histone deacetylase HDA1 in the skin 1 mutant, finding that L2 now expressed to some degree in most embryos. This was caused by a decrease in variability in end one expression as compared to the wild type, suggesting that chromatin remodeling is indeed involved in end one expression variability. Well, I hope we have convinced you that gene expression variability is at the root of at least one incompletely penetrant developmental phenotype, which is a phenomenon that is common not only in C. elegans research literature, but in human disease as well. We think it likely that gene expression variability may be at least partially responsible for phenotypic variation in these cases, and that random variation is an important factor in determining the differences between individuals. Before closing, I would like to thank the various people involved in this work. This was joint work I performed together with Scott Rifkin, now at UCSD, when we were both postdocs in Alexander Van Oudenarden's lab at MIT. We would also like to thank Eric Anderson and other members of the Horvitz lab for helping us get started with C. elegans. 
Finally, I would like to thank Sanjay Tiagi, with whom I worked to develop the single molecule fish methodology. My research was supported by a postdoctoral fellowship from the NSF and by a career award at the Scientific Interface from the Burroughs Welcome Fund.